this uh, <coughs> lecture series or or talk series, Oasis Lunchtime Talks. Uh, this is our second uh, talk, and uh, the series will go on until early May. Uh, so we'll have at least five more talks uh, after today. Uh, the next one's actually already uh, next week. Uh, we got Jan Swelt uh, uh, in seven days. But today uh, we, we got uh, Sabine Hara, uh, who's uh, started at the Center of Excellence uh, in, uh, in February. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Like so a kind of newcomer to, to us and uh, that's uh, why we've agreed that Sabina will actually kind of uh, provide the introduction to her work uh, herself. Uh, so I'm not trying to do that here. But I mean, you're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction and thank you all for coming and staying. <laughs> um, I appreciate it. Also, I'm very excited to have my very first talk here in this beautiful space in the Oasis. And I hope you have a, a lovely time while listening, um, or like a comfy time in your cushions. Um, so just a quick word about myself. I'm a postdoctoral researcher, I just started as Oli <coughs> mentioned, um, uh, and at the um, Center of Excellence of uh, Game Culture study, Studies, and I'm also a member of the Copenhagen Game Collective, and that's kind of relevant for also my research because um, occasionally these, these two identities blend. Um, so I'm using design uh, as a lens to do research, uh, which is called reflective game design. Um, design as a way to think about the world and politics and identity and also as a way of testing interventions in practice. Um, I'm also occasionally jamming and uh, exhibiting some stuff. Uh, here is a map of some uh, places of action where I've been. Um, the yellow points are talks, the um, pink ones are exhibitions, and the blue ones are game jams. As you can see, I've already been to Finland once. <laughs> um, I've also just authored a book on games and bereavement in which I also use um, game design as a lens to look at attachment, uh, loss, and grief in video games and how game designers uh, can basically make games that create more depth on these topics. And if you want to learn more about that, you can also, you know, we are all media people, so if you feel the urge to tweet, that is my handle. Um, and there's the Facebook reference to the book. Okay, so, um, Creating games as a method to make a sense of human relationships. That's also the um, kind of focus of this talk. And um, I like this uh, description of reflective design to start with that comes by um, Phoebe Sangers and colleagues. Uh, and she, they say that some of our products are things to use, some are things to think with. The latter might have little practical use, but can encourage reflection on technology, its situated meanings in people's lives, and our own role as researchers and designers. I just put that here as a sort of um, primer to what, what we'll um, hopefully discuss later on also together. Uh, first of all, I would like to make a content notice. Um, there will be explicit contents. There will be references to genitalia and genitalia-shaped technologies. Uh, there will be explicit images, uh, explicit politics, and puns. So brace yourself, there will be some explicitness. Okay, um, off to the, off we go because there's 70 slides left. <laughs> so um, this talk uses a re reflective design lens, uh, and it is also, this is located in the field of computer human interaction, or called, uh, or shortly, CHI or HCI, some people say. Um, so uh, it, computer human interaction looks at the way we relate to technology as human beings. Um, and more concretely, this talk focuses on problems in this uh, current HCI tradition. More concretely, the problem of design conservatism. Um, conser design conservatism is uh, the fact that technology uh, tends to stay close to established 
industry interests and thereby inferentially inscribes conservative values into the products, processes, and things, digital tool, tools we use. Um, and uh, within the broader field of HCI, um, scholars have pointed to uh, design conservatism in terms of a particular challenge, namely, how do we simultaneously serve real-world computing needs and avoid perpetuating the marginalization of women uh, and indeed any group, uh, any marginalized group in technology. Uh, it would seem that serving existing needs, which is the traditional approach to HCI, is conservative and perpetuates the status quo. So how can we simultaneously cater to needs that are there and imagine needs that might exist in the future. It's kind of a paradox, and it requires a bit of um, intervention and testing, and of course, imagination through design. So, because if we talk about uh, technologies and tools we use at the moment, uh, there are some stru structures that seem to be baked into the very apps and technologies we use, for instance. This, one, this thing might be something that we don't see so often in a technology that you use. Is there anyone who has ever seen such a, um, such a thing in their daily practice of technology use? Yes, okay. One person, great. <laughs> we are in the future. Um, so what is more, what is more um, like, what is more, um, sort of present in our lives is the option is an option like this where we have to kind of make a very narrow choice between um, who we are and who we are not. But how are games affected by design conservatism? Um, if we look at the evolution of, of gaming hardware for instance um, the technology advances, but it uses the users and the, um, and the functions and the purposes, uh, and even the shape stays more or less the same. Um, this controller, for instance, PlayStation controller, still assumes a particular body with particular abilities and facilitates an arbitrary set of actions and interaction which have stayed more or less the same, and this is called evolution. Uh, and within game studies, um, there has been a specific term that has been coined to describe these dynamics, which is the hegemony of play. Has anyone heard this term before? Yes, uh, some ex excited hands. So just to reiterate for those who already know it and to introduce it for those who haven't known it, don't know it yet, um, the concept of hegemony of play uh, is a way to critique the way in which a complex layering of technological, commercial, and cultural power structures have dominated the development of the digital game industry over the past 35 years, creating an entrenched status quo which ignores the needs and desires of minority players, such as women and non-gamers, who in fact uh, represent the majority of the population. So, this is quite similar to what we've heard in a more general discourse on design conservatism. But basically what this is saying is that um, the hegemony of play uh, is creating an imbalance between those who create games and decide, make decisions, creative decisions over hardware, technologies, and play um, interactions, and those who consume those offers for interaction. This is peculiar and it is a very current um, kind of hot, hotly debated topic because if we look at the demographies of players, we see that they are changing. So there currently we see things like this where uh, the era of, of, a, of the so-called like the stereotype of typical assumption of what we would call a gamer, uh, the white male gamer is kind of ending. Um, because if we look at numbers that are, are available currently in the um, player dem uh, demographic distribution, 
we see that, for instance, in the US, uh, black kids play proportionally more than white kids. Uh, we see that 45% um, of all players are women. And we see that 65% uh, of women below 65 years old play games, which is a lot. Um, and the idea is that these tastes and experiences are not adequately catered to by the current offers in the games industry. So um, this is kind of the problem scape or scope that we're dealing with. This raises the stakes for spe uh, speculative game design. Uh, game design which, is, which does not only conservatively reflect values that have been there before, but which imagines new applications. This is a, a cat simulating game that I played at GDC two years ago um, in the alternative control section. Um, and indeed, one starting point for imagining different applications um, and breaking with uh, design conservatism are controllers, it's controller design. Controls and controllers uh, are the peripherals which players use as extensions of their bodies and minds to operate video games. So they are a key site, um, a key entry point into the project of altering the hegemonic status um, of mainstream game design. So this is one of the assumptions or possibilities that has been embraced. Um, and uh, this takes us to the question, how can we, what can we do? What tools can we use to um, work with controllers? And one um, concept that has been proposed, and it, you can also see in the title of this talk, is querying. So querying, um, by querying game controls and controllers, uh, we can uh, access more ways to question and transform and imagine uh, differences to how game design is currently imagined. Um, but more spe specifically, querying refers to problematizing apparently structural and foundational relationships with critical intent. And it may involve mischief, clowning as much as serious critique. So querying is uh, a set of tactics in response to design conservatism. And this takes me to the question that I'm asking here, how does querying effect play with standard hardware? Um, why do I use standard hardware as a focus point? Because it is the main side of hegemony, it's the, it's the design that gets reproduced. Um, and the question is how can we what can we do and how does our relationship to ourselves and to play change if we queer this hardware? This takes me to our agenda for today, what comes up. Um, first of all, are we gonna, I'm going to introduce to you some discourses on the mouse controller in particular. Um, the mouse controller as a high precision device is a masculine gamer object as a standard controller. And afterwards, I'm going to talk about what we did to queer these aspects, or to queer uh, the mouse to become maybe introduced to a different discourse. And I'll do that through the case study of the, in, the Andy game. And after that, we have, you have the possibility to play the game. Are there any questions so far? No? Just uh, feel free to ask questions anytime. Um, not, don't tend to get interrupted. I, I experienced that as a as an enrichment of uh, of a talk <laughs> like this. Um, so let's start with the mouse discourses. You have deserved these good animal pictures since you survived until now. Um, so first of all, uh, the mouse as a high precision device. Does anyone know this man? Yes. Uh, it was um, well. We just saw that film, but I don't remember. <laughs> yes. Who said that? France. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, that is correct. Um, quite a famous man. 
And this is what it looks like when he first introduced the mouse, the very first mouse, um, in what is called the mother of all demos in 1968. And um, this was the very first uh, time when uh, the world had ever seen a mouse um, and uh, seen an online um, seen online processing and video conferencing. These aspects were introduced in the uh, mother of all demos. And um, this was the mouse back then. This is what the mouse looked like. Um, and it soon established itself as a revolutionary way of pointing and clicking. Um, so it changed our, uh, uh, our relationship to the computer as humans. Because we, now we have something that we can hold on to and click and point. Um, the way that the mouse was studied after that, also by Engie Bart and other scholars, uh, in a scientific discourse is uh, interesting because there's a, a particular thing that people were interested in terms of the mouse as a um, tool, as a digital prop. And you can guess what it was. It was quantifiable performance. So um, the mouse, uh, there's a special focus on factors of movement, time, and accuracy. And um, so uh, Engelbert studied this performance of the mouse together with a guy called English and found that the mou mouse is the fastest device compared to other devices. So this sort of, um, this was illustrated by this a conspicuous overuse of a law which is called the Fitz Law. Um, in most of the mouse science studies, we find the Fitz Law, which is uh, a model that uh, describes the dynamics of pointing. Um, so by either by physically touching an object with a hand or finger, or virtually by pointing to an object on a computer monitor using a pointing device like the mouse. So this these studies around the mouse were very interested in this Fitz law and especially in finding out uh, which hardware <coughs> clicks the best. So we can kind of summarize this discourse as an interest in quantifiability and performance. As we know from Interstellar, this is quantifiable. Um, and this is amazing that we finally have something that can show how fast we can click. So this sort of specific interest in pointing and clicking in performance orientation uh, also affects a different, the second discourse that I'm talking about, which is the, sorry for the pun, uh, tool for gamer mouse collinity. Um, so as, as, a, as a way of, of showing off how good you can be as a gamer, I'm focusing here on the visual language, the nomenclature, and also the sales discourse when we talk about the mouse. Um, this is the Beth Ella Elite. Um, okay, so uh, for some reason, yeah, here we are. So here are the uh, some the three models. If we see them side by side, um, they're all about uh, kind of power language. If you just look at the at the na names, the nomenclature. Um, especially in the sales discourse, uh, they're dominantly staged as a hyper-masculine performance tool as equipment. Um, and uh, these names also sort of are heavily gendered, just Pulse Fire Search, Death at Elite. They really draw connections to sort of weaponized military context and sort of indicate that this hardware is still marketed to some sort of uh, cis male gamer demography and refies or um, reinforces um, the cliche that um, weapons and violence is connected to masculinity. Okay. Okay. So part of the reason why I have so many slides is because they repeat themselves. <sighs> oh, there's something horribly wrong. Okay, I think we're back. Um, for some reason, there were some slides that didn't show in the presentation, but they showed on the screen. Okay. 
Um, if we look at the at this in com combination with um, with esports and sort of framings of esports personalities, um, we can we have the equipment fact sheet. Um, we have a reference to the mouse and to the successful gamer persona, right? Um, this is uh, on prosettings.net, and this is Alexandra Kostyev, <coughs> I hope I pronounced this correctly, who uh, proudly poses next to a, a mouse model called Zoe FK1 Diviner Edition. Um, uh, like his username, Simple One, you see this here. Um, the mouse settings are quantifiable aspects of her personality, uh, reinforcing gaming and hypermasculinity at once. So we have this package of the gamer. Um, so simple one is part of a larger complex of what could be a gamer identity, and even some some cases a toxic gamer identity, as a male gendered, political, uh, potentially violent. Um, sort of hobby. Discourse 3. Um, okay. This is very weird. This is kind of the stance in queer game studies on the mouse. Uh, the mouse, as part of this set of standardized controllers, uh, is rejected because it is supposed, uh, it is assumed to standardize play and reproduce uh, normative players. So, um, what queer study, queer game studies focus on a lot is um, the creation of new controllers, self-made <coughs> controllers, alternative controllers. Um, like, uh, who knows this device? Yeah. What is it? Is it? I, I don't remember the name exactly, but as, as, as you can see, it maps something to any object, and when you touch the object, you're doing the action that is represented in that. Right. Kind of so, so that's called a makey makey. Yeah. Um, works very simply by putting um, this cable into a, a USB cable into co your computer and it turns everything into a keyboard or a game controller, including this banana. Um, this is a game made uh, by a Squinky and Marcotte in 2018 and it's called Russell, you leaves to me softly and what they did is they uh, used conductive um, devices to connect plans to the computer, and uh, it is uh, an, what they call an ASMR plant dating sim. So by touching the plant and touching parts of the leaves and the stem, uh, you can, the plant will communicate to you through ASMR poetry. Um, and um, that's kind of changing around the relationship to controllers, of course. And another example is uh, Promises by Ida Toft, which works through algorithmic vibration. So these objects are filled with algorithms, um, al algorithmi algorithmically programmed um, vibration um, controllers, and they mediate um, the exchange of these objects uh, through a playful interaction. So, so players are invited to interpret the vibrations and then um, connect them to an exchange in the, inside of the game. So this queer discourse on kind of abandoning the mouse or rejecting it as a hegemonic um, object sort of suggests that the mouse is beyond control. Um, or is it is it, uh, is it beyond repair? That's what I wanted to say. It's beyond control and beyond <coughs> repair. Um, so um, altogether, these three discourses uh, illustrate assumptions about technology, uh, and gender, and play, which construct a very limited image of the mouse <coughs> as a game design resource. Um, dominant associations are performance and efficiency-centered, 
and defining the mouse merely as a functional tool to assist information processing and precise action. This restricts the design space uh, of the mouse to a limited set of preferred interactions and, for instance, this performance-based pointing and clicking that has already prepared, been prepared by the science discourse on the mouse. So, um, what do we do now? That's the question. Um, this is one of the uh, suggestions that uh, maybe it was better that video games did not exist but now that they exist, we better repair them or um, do something with them that is interesting. That's at least um, a statement that resonates very much with, with me. Um, and um, we did that as a part as part of the um, strategies of querying the Andy game. Just a note on the context of, of our previous practice and that kind of reflects in how the Andy game has been made. Um, the Copenhagen Game Collective has worked before with standard controllers that were used in a non-standard way. For instance, I don't know if you're familiar with this Darkroom sex game from 2008. It's pretty old. Um, you're nodding. Can you briefly say what it's about? Darkroom sex game. Yeah. Uh, you uh, simulate a sexual encounter with uh, uh, it's a rhythm game, let's yes. put it that way. <laughs> so it's a rhythm and game. Um, but it's also a, a, a two-person game. Yes. So yes. Play it in pairs. You can play it in pairs, and you can also play it in orgy mode, which is with mm -hmm. four players. So then you have to find out who your partner is, and the objective in this game is to uh, synchronize your movements with the controller to the other person's movements, and then achieve a digital orgasm that kind of makes the controller blink and vibrate. Um, the other game is Jelly Stomp, which uses um, also PlayStation Move controllers in the water. And the objective here is to um, kill the light of the other person's controllers. So it's a more competitive game. Um, you see the, um, the light of the controller underwater, and you need to sort of find a way to, to step on it. So it's quite disruptive with. Um, assumptions about how to treat this technology with your human body. Okay, so um, I'll just play a trailer of the Andy game so you know what this game is kind of about. Can you hear this? So the Andy game is an um, experimental cooperative installation, a typical sort of reflective design, as you can see in the very prototype way that we made it. Um, it's an installation game which uses two standard mouse controllers to facilitate an intimate uh, experience, um, worn inside uh, custom-made pants, which are brought for you later. Uh, the mice are mapped directly to uh, the human player's anatomy, um, functioning as de facto representation of the crotch. Um, within the context of the, the Andy game, the mouse controller is framed as a genital area in which needs to be manipulated in order to move a highly polished 3D tongue on screen. 
When it comes to control, both players navigate the same tongue um, by simultaneously pressing down two mouse buttons with one hand and scrolling the mouse wheel with the remaining hand. This is an um, optimal way of playing the game. Uh, players have found other ways of using their hands to play this game. Um, so there's a time window of two minutes uh, and the players must navigate the time towards as many of the splashing dots as possible. There are good dots and bad <laughs> dots um, that are kind of decided in the beginning of the game and that players need to um, experiment with in order to find out which ones are the good ones. Um, so, um, yeah, so there's a withholding of information about each player's impact on the tongue. This is also something to experiment with. One player directs the tongue vertically, and one player directs the tongue horizontally. So that means that verbal communication is beneficial towards achieving the goal of the game, which is to get a high score. Um, and uh, this high score is displayed when the time is up. So uh, the point of this control scheme is to sort of undermine or counteract these three dominant discourses that we have seen before concerning the mouse and uh, speculating about um, how else we could use this device in our interaction, human-computer interaction. I would like to point out three factors. It's actually, we're actually almost done. There are three points that I would like to emphasize in the considerations <coughs> of the design, so three design factors. The first one, of course, is wearable design. <coughs> a wearable design as a way of introducing consent. Now, is there anyone who does not know what consent is? I hope not. Um, so just to reiterate, consent is all about, uh, it's a process that's important. It's not a, a point in time, but it's a process uh, where you find out exactly what each other wants <clears throat> before you play um, and acknowledge uh, what you definitely do not want to happen. Um, so consent is its own context that allows play to be both effective <coughs> and expressive. And this concerns all kinds of play. Um, so this, the central design decision to articulate the mouse controller to the human crotch area um, proposes some sort of, introduces the need for consent. First of all, um, players have to consent to put these pants on or do whatever with them but somehow interact with these pens. That is the first introduction of saying <coughs> yes to this activity of playing the game. Um, <coughs> but what we do here is we remove the mouse from its conventional place on a desk and articulating it to the lingerie. Um, articulation here can be understood in two ways. First, um, um, by at by uh, combining two things, the mouse and the luxury, and secondly, by uttering a message. This message is that um, is an invitation to not only touch the device, but touch yourself in the process. Um, and this intimacy of this, uh, intimacy of this interaction um, introduces consent as a, as a central concern, because it's you who decides how far you can go and want to go in uh, activating this gameplay situation, or realizing it. One other consideration of uh, when designing these variables is what variables we should make. Um, we would like we would like with this game to uh, accommodate different gender expressions. Uh, so there's luxury ranging from trunks to conventionally feminine um, panties, and then we also have um, a harness, as you can see in the trailer. Um, and the connection between mouse and luxury is managed through Velcro and buttons, so these adjustments or these combinations can be changed at any time, according to preferences change. Um, 
So one obvious commonality in the setup and more conventional gaming settings is that the mice in both cases are controlled by the human hand. So this is something that is still uh, done. However, while the motion towards a conventionally situ situated mouse is away from the body turning outwards, the under game frames the mouse as belonging to the player's body, it becomes part of their own anatomy, affording an inwards motion. Uh, movement towards yourself. So um, another aspect of consent is, um, as I already pointed out, the strategies players use themselves uh, in interacting with the prescribed control scheme. So this is our programmer um, debugging the game and this is the optimal way of playing the game, but there are other ways in which players can interact with this mouse controller. So um, finding your own way in this, um, in this experience of play is um, defining your own consent. The second factor is um, the introduction of failure by design. And this is done by withholding information. So in order to play the game, Players have to experiment with the tongue on screen and will maybe end up in a situation where the tongue is lost at one side of the edge or where they don't find the desired spot and don't achieve a high score. But this is part of the social negotiation that is taking place um, in, this, in this space, in this shared space of navigating the mouse. And this is also in, induced by this collaborative setting. One material aspect that leads to this failure setup is that some functions of the mouse have been um, consciously disabled, like the ability to move the mouse around. The mouse is fixed in place and sort of constrained more than it usually would. Um, and uh, finally, this failure of um, controlling the tongue um, correctly, precisely, is also a matter of figuring out who you are in this game. So there's no information on whether you control the vertical or the horizontal, vertical or horizontal axis, um, and this can cause starting problems. This is based on the idea that failure can be playful. In fact, it is one of the reasons why we play. Uh, and uh, I would like to quote Jack Halberstam here. What kinds of reward can failure offer us? Perhaps most obviously, failure allows us to escape the punishing <coughs> norms that discipline behavior and manage human development with the goal of the, uh, delivering us from unruly childhood to orderly adulthood. I found this very poetic. And um, it is kind of um, a, a spirit in which we created this game that um, perhaps we can even use standard hardware to facilitate such a space in which we go back to, the, to these unruly circumstances and embrace failure as a possibility of getting to know each other and ourselves. This takes us to ambiguity. Um, so ambiguity is usually conservatively assumed to be a bad thing in design. You want to remove ambiguity and make, for instance, usability uh, perfect and precise. Um, and it can be, of course, the case that um, if ambiguity is, uh, sometimes ambiguity is a, is a matter of, a factor for frustration. But it can also be a resource for design. Uh, to some players, it has been obvious, for instance, that the mouse is a vulva. Um, this is one of the <coughs> only examples that exists out there. This is actually a product, the G-Spot mouse. Um, and uh, for, some, for some players, it has been uh, clear that this is a vulva, but 
there are actually no limits to what players can read into these tools, uh, this, this device that they have on their body. Um, it's, it's kind of obvious that it is an, um, is an adolescent sort of pun based um, and, um, and a sort of explicit way of creating this failure space. Um, but the nomenclature of the hegemonic gamer mouse, for instance, tells us that the mouse has always been framed in terms of adolescent monikers. Um, so why not claim it for a different sort of adolescent approach to, um, to interaction? Um, so by celebrating the mouse as Valva, players are adding another angle to as adolescent gamer culture, uh, which is potentially more joyful and a bit less exclusive than toxic gamer culture. To quote Sengers again, um, ambiguity can be a desirable property, not only for artwork, but also in interaction, uh, in interface design. For example, to express uncertainty. Um, uncertainty in a system's precision, or to support users in rethinking the roles system plays play in their own lives. So it is a way to say, welcome players, you can project meanings onto our hardware and you're welcome to interpret the game in various ways that have, we have not anticipated. So I would like to leave you with, with this question. And this might be a question that if you want to try out the game, which, which I agree is maybe a daunting thing in this surveilled room. Um, but um, to think about <coughs> what is this tongue? Who is this tongue? Um, because we don't actually know. Um, the only thing we know is that it is a, a proxy through which the interaction is mediated and that it has something to do with desire. But um, if you play the game, just, I'll just leave you with this question. Who is this tongue and how do you relate to this tongue? Let's, let's just maybe start with saying one word that you associate when you see this tongue. Avatar. Avatar, <coughs> yes. Don't think about it so long, it's just like one word. Okay, let's count from three, down from three, and then after three, when I'm, I say one, after one, you say one word, okay? Three, two, one. Where? Like Woo! <laughs> yes, exactly. We tried actually uh, to use, uh, to optimize uh, uh, shader technology here to create a lubrication and messiness. So that's kind of like the uh, one way of in which we worked. Um, I have a small conclusion. Um, it's more like a conclusive thought, um, which is that uh, querying hegemonic hardware can open new avenues for facilitating play. Um, and um, let's work together to make the world more silly. Thank you. Okay, uh, we could take questions at this point and then maybe play later or... Is there anyone <coughs> who would like to, is burning to play the game now? <laughs> Maybe we'll take a couple of questions <laughs> and, uh, and ask. Yes, ask, uh, you can also yeah. just. Uh... <coughs> so, I mean, who, who wants to go first? Okay, I, I guess I could start. I, I'm just like thinking about like, like listening to listening to the talk. Uh, I think one way to read it. Uh, and this is just like one of the things kind of related to what you're saying is to kind of uh, see it as a as a call for controller studies 
And I'm just kind of thinking at that, I mean, within game studies, uh, we've had this kind of, uh, uh, let, let's say that the, the importance of understanding different platforms and the kind of platform specificity has been underlined. But I mean, what about kind of controller specificity? Uh, mm -hmm. Do we have like starting points for that or is this something that, I mean, we should actually kind of pay more, even more attention? Yes, I think there are lots of starting points um, already. Um, but but uh, it's it's correct that we mostly focus on platforms in term of uh, in terms of um, systems that uh, that people uh, own uh, in their homes <coughs> um, or that designers use to port um, to port the games to different environments. But maybe we should uh, focus a bit more on the experience of what is, what is the immediate experience of touching a controller. And I think there's um, there's lots of space to especially go into interdisciplinary studies of um, what it's like to to actually be a human person um, interacting with a with a thing that yeah, yeah. that's haptic and. Um, I feel like one thing that's maybe a problem to innovating controller design is, like you said, people don't have it. Because I feel like there are people that want to experiment with design, as you can see with all the games that were made with the Guitar Hero controllers when they became popular, or like the DDR maps and stuff like that. But it's this idea that when you make something, you want it to be experienced. And by making this custom controller, unless you have an audience that's able to have it, it's such an isolated yeah. event that I feel like you're not at least I, if I created something, wouldn't feel as validated because it wouldn't be as easy to share as something that people right. have access to. Yes. But I do think it's been interesting to see how people have made use of controllers that were intended for one specific thing in other contexts. Right. Yeah. And it's, I, I think the advantage of using standard controllers um, to for queer purposes or in queer framing <coughs> rather than making alternative controllers from scratch mm -hmm. is that there is a, a potential for DIY um, uses in your homes if you already have the standard controller. If you have a mouse at home, you could make, you know, make a framework around it, and uh, much more easy than creating something from scratch. So it could be, and, and I think that uh, one one avenue in which this has explored already a bit is the is the Nintendo Labo controller where part of the frame framing around the hardware is uh, user made or it's at least it's not user designed but it is user built um, by using cardboard in a particular way to to frame the, the switch controller right so um, I think that this could potentially be easier than um, and, and I totally agree. I think this is, uh, this is also one of the big problems of alternative controller design that um, that it is very difficult to to get out there and to yeah to distribute. There are some designs that I can think of that have made me use controllers in ways that aren't necessarily how they're supposed to be used in order to accomplish things like button presses that have to be really fast where I've actually had to put it down and hold it in a weird way or um, Mario Party for the N64 had a rowing game mm. where you had to quickly make the analog stick go around circles and if you did it with your thumb you weren't fast enough so my brother would beat me so we'd do it with the center of our hands and we actually wore all of the skin off of the center of our hands because we went like this and all of our friends did it that way even wow. though we hadn't communicated so that was the only thing that I could think of from like a standard commercial game that made me really do it weirdly but yeah Wow, that's interesting. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> at, at least in the old Dragon Ball games, when you do a Kamehameha or something, and there was a, 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 some kind of fight, you had to do the same thing. You had to hold the two stick, the, the two analogs, and the only way to do it was with your palm, definitely. Yeah. And you would break the <coughs> controller eventually. Even. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> thanks for the thought. It's, it's really interesting. Uh, continuing the discussion, <coughs> uh, uh, are you aware of uh, this kind of alternative distribution schemes for the kind of more art-oriented uh, uh, games or experimental games that would also involve uh, like 
uh, 3D printing schemes, mm -hmm. uh, because that that would be uh, opening up avenues of uh, <coughs> distributing not only the digital paint but also the uh, blueprint for alternative yes. uh, physical controllers or uh, yeah. add-ons. I think, I mean, I'm not aware that there is a market around that yet, but I think that is coming up. Or maybe I'm. Maybe someone else knows uh, whether this has already been done, but as far as I know right now, the distribution is more or less limited to um, game festivals and more or less uh, also museums if they buy such a, um, an alternative controller. Um, but uh, this sort of like open distribution to, in terms of 3D blueprints, I'm not aware that this is happening, but it goes that direction, I think, definitely, for sure. Yeah. It, uh, it is, of course, that uh, when we are talking about this kind of uh, that has conceptual uh, sort of layer also to the uh, interpretation of mm -hmm. and framing of the experience, uh, then just handing people random random people with a blueprint it uh, might not work out. Yeah. So in, in any case, you need to provide with some kind of uh, yeah. sort of introduction to the experience. But now that you say it, I. I think it maybe this this will also expand the print and play universe. Um, that is already happening in the board game scene where um, <coughs> benevolent creators uh, put their games up for print and play, and uh, all you need to do is basically download and print. And maybe this will also be expanded through 3D prints. Yes. Yeah. This, what you're saying here got me thinking, and I. Uh, Unfortunately, only have it on this screen, but I found here a mod for Pokemon Go that is a 3D print thing you put on your phone in order to <coughs> more precise ball strikes. So, like digital alternative, um, no, physical alternative controllers that you can print already exist. Yes, so, uh, thank you. Yeah, that's very mainstream, though. I don't know. Yeah, but it, yeah, but it is, uh, I mean, we have a lot of Pokemon scholars here, so that might be of interest. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, or thoughts? I'm wondering about uh, sort of when you talk about querying the controller. Uh, I, I know that in queer studies there's this ongoing debate as to is it are there queer mechanics or is it just that sort of any queer mechanics that you come up with they will be uh, appropriated by mainstream mm -hmm. game industry if, sort of, if they're successful. Sort of, do you see this sort of? Uh, do you see this in sort of a, in a similar relationship to that, or, or do you see that that controllers have something that is more queer than mechanics? Yeah, I think that is. Uh, this is a really really interesting uh, conversation because, um, yes. So the question is, can um, is are, is there something like as far as I understood it, uh, is there something like essential queer mechanics or not? Or will everything be get uh, sort of appropriate again? And I think that, unfortunately, it's the latter. <laughs> I believe that once something becomes mainstream, it becomes hegemonic and it becomes um, unchallenged. So, um, however, I think that certain relations, ships maybe you can have with your body um, that are <laughs> currently beyond the norm. Um, might be mechanics that kind of stay queer, but this is related to the to the more societal level of how we allow ourselves to um, to interact in general, um, or how to uh, we allow ourselves to frame our bodies, um, and um, and I think that the mechanics of queer mechanics um, cooperate with that discourse. That makes sense. Um, yeah. But I do see a danger of essentializing, essentializing and institutionalizing queerness, for sure. Other questions? Would this then be the moment when the volunteers, uh, <laughs> the potential players, <laughs> stand in? I'm interested in trying, absolutely, if we, if we can find a, uh, a thing about a, a two-player two game. Yeah, it was a two-player game, so... Uh, 
We don't have to though. I mean, uh, it's uh, it's up to you. But the game exists, and if you're interested in playing it at some point, you can just come and ask me. That's no problem. Very good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.